Hi, once again it's time for another video, and due to popular request, I'm going to cover the Gestalt principles of visual perception as they relate to photography. Gestalt is the principle of totality, or the unified whole, which is often stated as the whole is more important than the sum of its parts, which is based on this quote of Wolfgang Kuhler, the whole is different than the sum of its parts. Now I believe most of this comes from our subconscious desire for self-preservation. Upon first exposure, one needs to identify the overall situation and any potential threat as quickly as possible. And in order to do that, the brain interprets and simplifies what the eye sees based upon associations, past experiences, and prior knowledge. In Kurt Kafka's Aesthetic Gestalt in Interpreting Art, it states that there are three factors, the self, the art, and the connection between them. And this is all important because past experience, prior knowledge, and your personal association with the environment around you significantly impacts how you interpret the environment around you. Before getting too far into it, I think it'll be useful to cover some basics of human vision. The human eye has a very narrow field of sharp focus based in the foveola, which is approximately a one degree field of view. For instance, you cannot focus on two fingers side by side simultaneously. Similarly, the eye has a very shallow focus tolerance or depth of focus, and you cannot focus on two fingers in a row simultaneously. Combined with the central field of view, you have near peripheral vision, which extends to about 60 degrees and allows for identification without focus based on prior knowledge. This is called the zone of comfort, and it correlates with the approximately 55 degree field of view of what's considered a normal lens. Binocular vision is most useful within arm's length for depth perception and fine control of dexterity. Beyond about 10 feet, binocular vision is nearly non-existent and the visual cues we use for distance estimation are primarily monocular. And that's why portraits are generally best taken at or beyond 10 feet where monocular vision of the camera correlates with your vision. In other words, it eliminates lens distortion, which is really just perspective distance. The very narrow one degree field of sharp focus combined with the 60 degree zone of comfort and the need to quickly assess a scene and make sense out of it big picture means that when we view a scene, we primarily look dead center. These are the results of almost 1,000 test subjects viewing almost 1,500 photographs or images. And they all show a very heavy central bias other than the last two here, which were web-based. And these show characteristics of the F pattern of Western readers. But the rest of them are all very heavily centrally focused. And there are many studies that correlate to this. And it's called a central vision bias. Now in the environment, you tend to focus above center because what's close to you, you've already experienced. And then scan within your field of view, the zone of comfort, and larger scan patterns are combined with head movements. But when we're presented with a piece of art, whether it's a painting or a photograph, vision starts center-weighted, which contradicts the common perception of reading a photograph left to right, which is really only appropriate for Western viewers who read left to right. It would be completely opposite for others who read right to left. Now, I previously stated that when we're first presented with a situation, one of the primary things we do is identify any potential threats subconsciously and immediately. And that's where the monocular cues for distance estimation come in. Because our biggest threat is going to be what's closest to us. Now, I'm not going to cover all of the monocular cues. There's about four of them that I think are of relevance. The first is vertical position in the field. That is, whatever is lowest in the field of view is closest to you, and the depth of an image almost always begins at the bottom. Overlapping contours is a second. Whatever is masking a portion of another object is closer to you. Third is known size. If you know the actual size of something, then you know its distance approximately based upon how large it appears. This is particularly effective when there are two things that are known within the scene, such as a car and a person. And then the last is linear perspective. Parallel lines converge over distance. The lines do not have to be exactly parallel nor straight. 
such as the banks of a river. Now, all of this is relevant because the characteristics of human vision and the use of monocular cues is subconscious and instantaneous. They affect the way we perceive the world around us, and what we know about the world around us has a significant impact on that, even if what we know is not actually a fact. Okay, so getting back to Gestalt principles. The first thing to understand about Gestalt principles is that they stand in isolation, meaning they are not interdependent. Multiple of the characteristics exist simultaneously, then whichever is most prominent will win. Now, the first concept of Gestalt principles is figure ground, which is identifying the subject, which is nearest and of greatest concern. In photography, we would just call this subject background. Now, you have four characteristics. You have unstable, in which case you might see faces or you might see a vase. You won't find this in photography very often. You have ambiguous, and you might consider that poor subject separation from the background, such as this example. Now, you obviously first see the elk because he's dead center, but then you don't really know what the point of this image is. It's cluttered, distracting as opposed to this image that has good subject background separation. Or we have this example, which again is busy, as opposed to this example, which is also busy, but your eye immediately goes to the subject because it's in the center of the image. Now in photography, this is also often considered a negative because it's more of a static composition, but the eye will still move around the image to other areas of interest. The other two characteristics of figure ground we would consider in photography as size, contrast, or negative space. Well, the first is that whatever is largest is closest to you. If it is dominating your field of view, it is obviously the closest thing within your field of view. And that applies to an image as well, such as this. The bull is obviously the closest thing in this image. The other concept is that whatever is smallest is also closest. And that is because if there's something larger that is closer, it would overlay and completely obscure the smaller object. Now we would normally consider this negative space or luminance contrast, such as in this example, or color contrast, such as in this example. The remaining principles of Gestalt fall under what is called pregnans, which is a German word that translates to concise or precise. It is the law of simplicity or good form. Max Wertheimer had it broken down as proximity, pregnans, common fate, and similarity. Uh, it was later expanded. Stephen Palmer in 1999 added reification, symmetry, common region, proximity, synchronicity, continuation, and there have been many other additions to Gestalt principles such as focus, which is really just another version of contrast, and the idea of emergence, things becoming apparent over time, which is kind of the opposite of Gestalt principles, or it's an example of poor pregnance. Now the first principle I'm going to discuss is closure, also called reification. And this is the mind's tendency to see what it's familiar with. What is simple? In this example, you probably see a triangle because it's easier than seeing three separate shapes. And here you probably see a sphere with spikes, even though the triangle and the sphere do not exist. This is what allows us to see the snowy owl, even though large portions of its outline are missing. Now I edited this image just for this example, but it makes the point. It also allows us to fill in details of an image. In this image, I know that's a bull elk without being able to see anything other than an outline, a silhouette, or even a partial silhouette. Now, someone else might see this as a red deer or a caribou, but it doesn't really matter. It's what allows things to extend off the image without seeming wrong. I know that there's more watch it is not relevant to the image and is not disturbing that it is cut off. Whereas in this image, inability of closure 
meaning I know there should be more of a face, there should be a person there, but it can't be. So there's a conflict, and this image seems more disjointed than the previous examples of things not there that should be. The next principle is called symmetry. And it states that things that are similar are viewed as being singular or together. For example, even if they're further apart. For example, these two brackets are similar and are associated with each other, whereas these two brackets are closer together, but they are dissimilar and are seen as separate objects, separate subjects. And more importantly, or additionally rather, when you have similar details that encompass a space, whatever is in between them is considered to be part of it as well. And they enclose something of importance. And this might be an example of symmetry. When you first see this image, you might see the hat, probably jump to the, the bald guy real quick, but then eventually the subject of this image becomes the pair and then the dissimilarities. One's a statue, one's a person. Likewise, there is the principle of similarity. The ones that are more alike are seen to be singular. So you see two rows and a single row. You see a group of squares or you see a row of similar tonal objects with a heavier, darker objects being closer and of more importance. Now an example of that might be this image where you have all similar ducks falling as the uh, ground, the background, and the subject being the basically dissimilar object. Or this example where the figure is obviously the contrasting brick and the ground is all the matching bricks. And in this case, it's interesting to note that negative space doesn't have to be actually nothing. We could consider the blank brick wall as negative space and the lighter brick being the subject of this image. And to be honest, these are probably better examples of dissimilarity or contrast than they are of grouping by similarity. I just didn't have any particularly good images readily available. Now the next principle is called common region. So if we take the same associations from similarity and then we encompass a grouping, they're seen as the subject now. We might consider this an example of natural framing, for example. You may see the rock as the subject, what's inside the rock as the subject, but you almost certainly do not see what's outside as the subject of this image. The next principle is called proximity or continuation. Again, it's grouping by association. Those that are closer together are considered to be singular, a singular subject. In this example, you probably see three rows of goals rather than 10 goals. Another principle is called common fate or synchronicity. As things that have the same direction are associated as being the same or together. So you see a group of arrows pointing down to the right and a group of arrows pointing up to the right. In this example, all three riders and motorcycles are having the same flow direction and gaze direction. They have the same fate. Whereas in this example, this third motorcyclist is separate, secondary to the image in relation to these two that have a similar fate, even though the spacing of the three is very similar as it was in the previous. In this example, they both are closely associated, have the same direction, and are considered basically a singular subject of this photo. Of course, there's nothing else. And it doesn't have to be actual motion. It can be gaze direction. For most people, these two wood ducks will be associated as a pair with a third wheel hanging out down to the lower left. The next principle is called continuation. And it states that if the eye is following a direction of flow, 
it will continue on that direction rather than change. Example, if you're following left to right on this line, you probably continue on through the red as opposed to change direction. Similarly, when you look at this, you probably see two lines forming an X. You do not see a V in a carrot or a lesser sign, a greater sign, unless I point it out to you. An example of continuation might be this image. When I look at this image, I first land dead center on the red, and my eye tends to follow the red around in a circular pattern, as opposed to jump around in other directions. Or perhaps this example. I first land on the face, and then my eye wants to follow along the neck as opposed to other directions. Initially it follows the neck. And the last principle is called parallelism, which is linear perspective. Parallel lines converge in the distance. This imparts a direction, it imparts depth, and lines point to things. It, these parallel lines proceed far enough into the distance, they will form an arrowhead, a point, pointing to something. Now we tend to think of this as leading lines, but remember this is more subconscious. So what would generally happen is the eye will jump to what's being pointed to, or it's going to land on first what is closest and then follow the lines into the distance. For example, of this image, which has the parallel lines giving depth, fading off into the fog in a direction. You have this example. You probably landed about here, went to the bottom because it's the heaviest and closest, and then follow the lines up to nothing. But it's not really leading lines because if we invert this image, it doesn't work. We do not land here and lead down to here. We land here, it's confusing. We end up going back up here maybe, or down to here. It's just, it's, it's not right. To finish up, I'd like to show a few examples that combine multiple of the Gestalt principles. This is this example. It has contrast as a centered subject. It has converging lines, or parallelism, and it has symmetry, bracketing the subject. All these combine to make it very clear that the subject is this pawn making the first move. In this example, we have proximity in a mating interaction, but it is not nearly as good an image as this one, which has symmetry and prox, which creates a much greater sense of interaction and connectivity between the two. In this example, we have an adult duck and two chicks. I know that because I've seen them before, but it's hard to say what the subject of this image is. We have proximity of these two together, which makes them want to be the subject, but they have dissimilar fates or directions, whereas the two chicks have similar fates, which makes them want to be the subject, although they're too far apart, which hurts that association, and the three of them have too much dissimilar between them for them to be the subject of the image, a singular subject of the image. Here we move one chick closer to the other, then we have the two chicks with similar fate or direction and proximity and the adult having a different fate or direction and it tends to make the subject of this image the chicks with the adult overwatching part and also because they're in the center if we then instead reverse the direction of the chicks 
Now they all have a similar fate and similar proximity. And now the subject of this picture is the three of them moving off together. And finally, if we add another adult, we have the symmetry of the adults bracketing the chicks. And it is now the chicks in between them that is the primary subject and all four of them together as a secondary subject of a family, chicks being overwatched by a pair of adults. In this example, we have a branch and a log that starts the foreground, so bottom of the image, so it's very close. It's also seems to have a circular continuation, whether you go left to right or right to left. And there might be a bit of completion going on where the mind is making all that uh, very heavy, which to me distracts from the image. Whereas if we can just break this pattern up, we end up with, if anything, maybe now it is converging lines pointing to the squirrel, or maybe it's leading lines going to the squirrel. But either way, the image works much better this way to me. Well, to finish this up, I would like to leave you with a quote by Roland Barthes, which he wrote in his book, Camera Obscura. A photograph is always invisible. It is not it that we see. So until next time, I hope you have a great day.